So let's actually begin um, today's discussion. Rather than the sort of preliminary introduction that we've already done, I want to now look at the actual case of the Milgram experiment. And we, looked a we talked a little bit about the, uh, the ethics of, uh, of the experimentation, what the experimenters were actually doing and how they were conducting the experiment and the potential problems with that. But I'm more interested in particular in the findings. So what did you think? What did you think of the Milgram experiments? Having seen this, having taken a look at this, what can you take away from it? So let me, let, me run it, let me run through it very briefly. So the idea of the experiment was to study obedience. How obedient are, is your ordinary person to an authority figure when that authority figure is telling them to do something they know is wrong? That's what they're trying to figure out. And shockingly, perhaps, the answer is damn near anything, which should trouble all of us because we are, by and large, ordinary people and are probably quite prone to following along when told to do absolutely terrible things under the right circumstances. We'll come back to this. But the experiment went something like this. The, um, there was one test subject and one actor. So the, the learner in, uh, in the documentary, the guy who was, who was allegedly receiving the electric shocks, he was actually another, uh, another researcher. He was an actor. He was, he was there to try and convince the other guy that he was being horrif horrifically tortured. The teacher, the one who was delivering the shocks, or at least he thought was delivering the shocks, that was the test subject. But the experimenters presented it to them as if they were both anonymous test subjects and they were randomly selected who would be the teacher, who would be the learner. The idea here, what they told the test subject they were studying was, how do we teach information to people and what are effective means of getting people to remember things? And one theory that they wanted to allegedly test was, well, what if you're punished when you get an answer wrong? And so the idea that they said they wanted to study was, well, let's look at delivery methods of the questions, delivery methods of the information, and comparative social statuses of the individuals uh, who were teaching and learning. Neat. This also was a good excuse to, uh, to uh, ask them uh, survey questions in advance about their comparative social positions, which wound up being relevant to the uh, to the obedience test, even though it turned out not to be a significant variable, which is also weird and interesting and disturbing. We'll get to that too. So they sat the two down. They got the actor who was the, quote, learner, strapped into a chair with an electrode stuck on his arm. The guy, again, an actor, reported that, well, I have a minor heart issue. This isn't going to be dangerous, is it? And the, the experimenter says, no, 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 don't worry. They're, they're, they might be painful, but they're not dangerous. Don't worry. Shut the door. Locked him in a room by himself. The experimenter stands next to the, quote, teacher, the actual test subject, <coughs> observing, writing things down, et cetera. And so the teacher is giving off these word pairs. Basically, he's, the, the mechanics of the actual quiz are not particularly relevant to the findings. Because essentially what he was wound up doing was pressing these little levers with increased shock values that he thought he was delivering to the other person. Going from, I think it was 5 volts all the way up to 450. Now, technically speaking, you know, that, that, that shouldn't be deadly. Extremely painful, though, um, because amperage is what kills you, not voltage. Uh, but again, if you have a heart issue, it could cause issues, perhaps. Not sure. I'm not a doctor. I don't know the details of that. So he was going up and pressing the buttons, pressing the buttons, pressing the buttons, as far as he knew, delivering painful shocks to the other person, who eventually starts crying out in pain, demanding that he be let go to stop the experiment, refusing the answer, refusing to answer the questions at all, right? and then eventually just not responding at all. After a few more cries out of pain, he just doesn't say anything else. 
that was about when they got to, I think it was in the high 300 volts. So there was still about 70 volts more to go. And he kept going. Most of the participants kept going all the way up to 450 volts and then kept hitting the 450 volt lever several times before they were told to stop the experiment. This being a significant amount of time after the other person stopped responding. So essentially, uh, the, the test was, can you, you being the experimenter, uh, posing it as an authority figure, a, a scientific authority figure in this case, can you convince your average everyday person off the street, a representative sample of the population, more or less, to kill someone? And the answer is yes. At least most of the time, the answer is yes. OK, so before having seen this documentary and gone through any of this, raise your hand. How many of you think that you would not have gone all the way? How many of you think you would have stopped before getting to that 450 volts? OK, a um, little more than half. You're probably wrong. But maybe not all of you are wrong. Because again, under those circumstances, the ones presented there, the desist rate, in other words, the, the, the percentage of people who stopped, who refused to continue the experiment, was about 40%, less than half. And there were a little more than half of you who said, no, I definitely would have stopped. Rethink that. This is one of the key takeaways of this experiment. Yeah, yes. What was that? Oh, this was done, this experiment was conduct, conducted, I believe, in the late 50s. Or at you first. Consider that it, generationally wise, it, it is different because we view everything else differently. Maybe. Every single generation view differently. Maybe. To a degree, certainly. But I think the most we can say about that is that the conditions for obedience would have to be different. Well, also, there was, there, there was a lot of unrest back then. So a lot of people were more willing to follow government officials and any sort of not government officials, but like any sort of like authority that was telling them to do something, it was more likely for them to follow it because there is no reason for them to not. You really think so? I feel like it. Yeah, but do you think it? <laughs> think, think about people today, including yourself maybe, but it might be easier to think of other people because we're more likely to think negatively of other people and we don't want to think negatively of ourselves, even though we sometimes deserve to. I certainly deserve to think negatively of myself sometimes in circumstances like this. It's true, though, and this is actually an important lesson to take away from it this. Is, it is true, but you shouldn't self-deprecate that much, you know? Like, no, you, you should. should still, like, the I'm things gonna... that you can dislike yourself, but you should still love yourself. No, absolutely. I love myself and I like myself, but there are things I don't necessarily like about myself, there are things that I'd certainly like to do better. And that's an important thing to acknowledge, especially in a context like this. So. Something, I'll, something I'll, I, will, I will grant is that having conducted this experiment like 60 years ago, and with this experiment, at least to some degree in the public consciousness, <coughs> that, I think, has made people significantly more aware of their ability to be coerced, cajoled, convinced to do nasty and terrible things to each other. And that awareness can, I think, and I hope, and there have been some studies about this, but they haven't been quite as solid and quite as scientific because, again, the ethical difficulties with conducting these kinds of experiments are pretty serious. But knowing this can help to mitigate the effect of this kind of unethical obedience. If you acknowledge it, reconcile with it, and actually wrestle with the issue. Now, if you just say, well, I, I would never do such a thing, there's no way, then you absolutely would. Absolutely. No question. And again, I, I think if we take a nice, careful look at even our society today, we can absolutely see that maybe not I, well, probably I, but lots of people will absolutely go along with horrible, terrible things when asked to or told to under the right circumstances by the right people for the right given reason, even if it's the right sort of retroactive justification. 
And again, I think that one of the only ways of mitigating this is to recognize the effect involved, right? the, effects of, uh, the effects of authority that, that this sort of situation can have on us, not just them, but us, me included. And why I say that I think it is important to self-deprecate to some degree with, with respect to this sort of thing is that's part of what's involved in acknowledging um, my own potential fault, my own potential susceptibility to this sort of thing. And by acknowledging that I'm not special, I am like most people in most relevant respects, and that I, I probably can be coerced, cajoled, convinced, or tricked into doing terrible things to innocent people under the right circumstances. That, that acknowledgement and thinking through what those circumstances might be, how, why, what could be said to convince me, by whom, under what circumstances, when, where even, because again, they studied particular locations of doing this experiment as well, which didn't have much of an effect, but it did have some. But knowing what those circumstances might be, for me in particular, might help to mitigate the effects of these really, really nasty social impacts that we can have and we can have had done to us, etc. I mean, going back to your initial point as well, there are particular social circumstances at any given time that have a significant effect on things like this, on the obedience, on, on willingness to defer to authority, et cetera. But we also should note that this sort of thing happens throughout history, throughout the world, every culture, every time, pretty regularly and pretty disturbingly. Yes, this, this whole thing was trying to figure out what happened and how it is that, say, in this particular case, the German people could be convinced to mostly become Nazis. Because that was a shocking development. But part of this study and part of this finding is that maybe we shouldn't have been so shocked. Because sure, yeah, it happened in the 1940s, in the 30s and 40s, really, in Germany. But, you know, it also happened 15, 20 years earlier in Russia. And it also happened 15, 20, well, no wait, <clears throat> like 40 or 50 years earlier, eh, maybe a little less, 30, 40 years late, earlier, um, throughout, most of, uh, throughout most of the United States, Reconstruction era. Similar things were happening with a different tone, with a different tenor, with a different end, but still the kind, of, uh, the, the kind of hostility between people that resulted from a kind of deference to authority, which resulted in terrible abuses of people, of innocent people. And if you go back you know, a few years before that, and a few years before that, and a few years before that, and a few years before that, you'll find countless examples of this all around the world, of people who ordinarily, of their own volition, would never do this sort of thing doing this sort of thing. So again, like I said, I think that the means can be different. Right? So that maybe the authority has to look different under different circumstances. Maybe we, we are more prone to follow certain people but not others. Uh, certain manners of authority stated in certain ways under, under certain different circumstances, but that's all stuff that you can figure out. Especially if you're willing to study it like this, and they, they certainly were in this case. They were able to find it. In fact, uh, one of the things that this documentary didn't go over, um, but one thing that they found uh, was the difference between the experimenter wearing a, uh, wearing, um, a nice suit, a shabby suit, or a lab coat was actually quite significant. That a shabby suit had the least obedience, followed by a nice suit, followed by a lab coat. Lab coats had the most, uh, had the highest level of, uh, level of obedience. Again, because it was associated with a psychological experiment, and this was presented as a psychological experiment, and so it was, it was under, it was seen as under the purview of scientific analysis, and so the authority figure matching with the kind of experience that people were conditioned to expect, boom. 
they follow along with it. Because why wouldn't they? Well, I mean, we know why, why they wouldn't or shouldn't, because murder. And again, that might differ under different circumstances. You would probably um, say, uh, again, another close parallel circumstance is uh, following unjust orders in a military context. You'll find that that has happened all throughout history as well. And the, the way that the orders are delivered and under the right circumstances by the right officer for the right purpose at the right enemy, et cetera, has a significant impact on a level of obedience. But the level of obedience is still disturbingly high. Again, just look back to World War II and well, there you go. What else can we gather from this? Any other thoughts that you might have had about, about the experiments, about how it was presented, about findings that we might find interesting, troubling? Yeah? I was kind of surprised that uh, most of the participants just like sat there when the guy was like screaming his head off through the thing and it was like breaking with the speaker, like that's how loud it was. Like, well, you'll notice that's where some of them tried to draw the line. Right? They said, we need to check on that guy. Is he okay? They stopped. They said, well, I'm not going any further. But then they talked themselves back into it. Right? Which, you know, that's a thing that we might do. And then, once you've talked yourself back into it, I think what you're noticing as well is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, um, that when people kept going, um, kept going after thinking about stopping, they started hyper-focusing. At least that's what I was seeing, at least. Yeah, they were like, oh, like, how's he doing now? Yeah, they were like, worried about it. Or it came into a, or turned into a sort of procedure, or they integrated it into what they were doing. Now those are slightly different things, right? So in some cases, um, I'm thinking of the the first guy who kept going for a while but eventually did stop, who was, who after he wanted to stop but then went back and didn't, he was intensely focused on the questions and wouldn't even look at the numbers, right? The numbers of the switches he was flipping, and so it, it, while the person was screaming, right, screaming through the wall, because by the way, it wasn't a speaker. In that circumstance, there, there was a speaker. It was all pre-recorded. But it was just a speaker pressed up against the other side of the wall. So this was as if they were hearing him screaming from the other side of the, from the, other side of the wall. This was all really well designed to test people's willingness to go too far. And, you'll no, and like I said, you'll notice this, that the guy was, instead of well, because he had already decided that, well, we need to keep going. He focuses on what needs to be done, which is the test, the research. And eventually, it just became too much. And that guy in particular, he desisted. He said, no, I'm not going any further, <clears throat> which good for him. That's good, certainly. There were other cases where uh, the, guy who, the, the guy they showed go all the way to 450 volts. Um, who, yeah, where after a certain point, when the guy wasn't answering, he included sort of as part of his response, are you all right? Please respond, are you all right? Zap. Yeah, so he did respond, and he still did zap. Right. Well, this actually speaks to a way that we might help convince ourselves to go along with things like this. I'm trying, I'm helping. I'm doing, it, I'm doing something to try and make things right. Even though, yes, I'm also responsible and directly, uh, directly causally and to a large extent morally responsible for the harm being done, I'm trying to mitigate that harm in some way, right? If you can convince yourself of that, that I'm doing okay, right? I'm, I'm trying to help. 
that it's the experiment that's hurting him. I'm trying to make it less bad. I'm trying to do something good. If you can convince yourself that you're actually doing something good under these circumstances, yeah, it makes it much easier to do something bad. Careful of that. That's a really easy one to fall into from experience. Not just from experience, but historically as well. Um, what was the book? I can't remember what book this was. I wish I could remember. But there was a, um, a book that was, it was basically compiled interviews from SS officers um, who their job was basically the suppression of um, what amounts to rebellion in conquered lands under, under the Third Reich. Um, and all of their initial justification was, someone is going to do this job. If I don't do it, somebody else is. And I can at least do it more, more ethically, more kindly, more gently. By the end of the war, they were sadistically torturing civilians for fun. Every single one of them. Well, because if they weren't, somebody else would have been worse. I mean, no. Well, maybe. But still, no. That would have been maybe somebody else's justification, too. And again, that, that kind of situation is exactly why they wanted to study this. And it, it's interesting, shocking, but interesting the results that we get, that yeah, people can easily convince themselves to go to extreme, terrible lengths. Because, well, someone's going to. And if I'm already doing it, I should do it right. I should do it well, and I should, be, I should try and be helpful in pursuit of it, rather than going to extremes. Again, all of these are little, are little tricks that we play on ourselves to help us to do the things that we're convinced to do. And again, if you're aware of all of this, if you're carefully aware of it and you're watching for it, then maybe, just maybe, you can avoid it. You can avoid being compelled or coerced or cajoled or convinced into doing this sort of thing. But maybe not. Maybe not. Any ideas why I assigned this right now, or like in the context of our other readings? Well, we were just talking about character and virtue, right? Right. So we're talking about character traits and stable traits that we might have, and our, our ability to do the right thing uh, habitually without due consideration. Now, there's something positive to that, and there's something potentially dangerous to that. On the positive side, if you have sufficiently developed virtue, you're far less likely to go along with something you know to be wrong, because it will be at odds with your stable, practiced habit. It'll be so difficult for you to do that it'll take a lot more convincing and a lot more shifting of the situation to convince you to. That's good. Part of the trouble, though, is that it takes a lot to develop habits that strong. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also that, well, we talked about this a little bit, that while the virtues all do kind of relate to each other, they're also quite specific. Prudence especially has to do with particular actions and particular kind of things. Knowing the right thing to do in a particular kind of circumstance usually the kind of thing that we can do. And if we're suddenly introduced to an alien circumstance, it becomes that much easier to, uh, to sort of guide someone the wrong way. The other thing is that, well, it can in fact be quite helpful to think things through very carefully, like I've been saying, right? If we're thinking things through very carefully, if we're thinking about the ethics of a situation, then we're far less likely to be uh, sort of led along to doing something horrifically wrong, but part of what virtue does is to make it so that we don't really have to think too hard about most situations. 
so we have to be careful that, that we're not led into doing something wrong through our proper virtues. Another thing like this might be, you know, in a case like the Milgram experiments, you might, you might have a particular dedication to wisdom and knowledge, knowing what's right and what's wrong, or maybe to, because again, it was presented as an educational study. It's about teaching and learning. You might have a particular dedication to, to want to know these sorts of things and want to help other people to learn and to be able to learn. Noble cause, good thing to do, good thing to pursue, good reason to pursue it. But that can, if you're careful enough, lead someone down the wrong path quite easily and quite effectively. Same kind of thing can happen to any of the other virtues. If you can lead somebody through a virtue towards some kind of a negative behavior, you, know, you can convince someone to do something wrong and they'll think that, at least at first, maybe not in retrospect, but there's a good chance they'll think it's the right thing to do. I mean, convincing something, somebody to do terrible things in the name of compassion is actually quite common. What, what specific? Like, um, there's a, there's maybe a lot of media where it's like, if I kill this person, this person that I love will stay alive. Is that kind Yeah, so the, the like, mercy killing kind of thing? Similar, but it's more like sacrificing one person so that you can get the thing that you want to be saved. Right. Okay. I, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, my mind goes to like goes to like zombie movies kind of thing, yeah. where that kind of thing. Where well, I don't I don't want this I don't want this person I love to go through this horrible thing, and so I'm gonna kill them before it happens. Well, if they've been bitten or infected or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that sort of thing. But then, because we think about those sorts of things, because we, we think about this kind of in a, in, a, in a storytelling context, in a media context, but it's usually not in the kind of context that we live in, right? We, we obviously don't live in a zombie apocalypse, but even we don't really live in a situation like most grand media narratives or the big stories that we hear or that we see or that we read or whatever. <clears throat> we live in a more mundane world, typically. And so when we think about these grandiose circumstances and we think of ourselves as ready to, to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed, don't be too ready to do that. Because under most circumstances, you won't need to. Yeah, I know, but most people wouldn't feel as though they were because right. of the media that we constantly see. Right. And yeah, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to that, right? That, that um, the stories that we hear, the media we consume has a it has a significant effect on how we develop character, right? how we develop virtue, and how we pre-choose things. Well, also, something, something that I always think about is, like, they bring up the thought of, like, if this was happening, what would you do? And then they make it a character reacting to that. But, like, then you have to think about it and, like, think, what would I do? But you're already kind of prejudiced because you saw how the other person reacted. That's true. So you're more likely to do it that way because you can't think of another way. Right. And I mean, again, this is something that the Milgram experiments tested as well. They, when they brought in um, multiple, uh, multiple Confederates in the experiments, where they had one person, Confederates meaning people in on the experiment, not like American <laughs> Southerners in the Civil War. I, I don't, it's a technical term, it's a technical scientific term, okay? All right. Anyway. Um, it also refers to members of any given confederation, which there have been a lot of throughout history, but whatever. Listen, 19th century is not my period. I don't think in this. I don't even think about that. Anyway, so but the point is when they brought in a bunch of people, actors basically, who were all continuing and going all the way through, they got a 90% rate of people going all the way through, of test subjects going all the way through. 90% of people, nine out of 10, or technically 36 out of 40, because there was 40 participants in each of these sets of studies, went all the way to 450 volts and kept hitting the lever after someone was non-responsive because the nine other people in the room with them were doing this, were at least apparently, as it seemed to them, doing the same thing. So when you do see other people doing something, 
you, you're more likely to follow it, but I think it goes even a little bit further than that. You don't, be, you don't want to be the one to step out of line. Something may happen, or even if not, it's, it, yeah, exactly. It singles you out in some way, right? Yeah, well said. Whereas, and they, they showed this the other way too, when someone else desisted first, I think, I think it was like less than 30% of people went all the way to 450, even when they were being controlled by, or encouraged by an authority figure, less than 30% continued all the way through. That's a huge swing. So it's all right. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, if you look at things like uh, bystander effects, which are, which are in fact still studied uh, pretty regularly in, in, um, in sociology, or in social psychology, I think. Um, yeah, th that, is, that is borne out in, in more recent literature as well, that if one, person is, if one person's willing to do something, suddenly a bunch of people are willing to. But if nobody does, being the first person takes a hell of a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> In fact, there was a um, story of a uh, psychology professor who taught this, taught the Milgram experiments. And uh, what they did was they, re they had rearranged the, the desks in a classroom in a circle, the one in the center, and came in and instructed the students, take a seat. If you get out of your seat for any reason throughout this class period, you immediately will fail the course. Then he put a goldfish bowl in the center table, took out the goldfish and set it next to the bowl, and left the room. Mm -hmm. No, on the table. Around. I mean, I assumed like one of these or something. Had enough room to stay there, flopping about for a while. Drowning, essentially. And it took one of the students, it took about, I think like seven or eight minutes for someone to finally stand up and put the goldfish back in the bowl. And of course, the professor was watching the whole time, came back in and said, see, this is it. This, this just showed you that none of you were willing to do what you knew was the right thing to do. Because nobody else was, and I told you not to. That should scare the living hell out of you. Because again, I mean, think of it this way. There's a very good chance that you, you personally, you in particular, would have made a perfectly competent guard at Auschwitz under the right circumstances. And it's up to you to figure out what those circumstances might have been, or might have needed to have been, might, might have needed to be, to get you to do things that you know are absolutely wrong. I could probably, con I realistically could probably be convinced to do all sorts of terrible things under the right circumstances. Threaten my friends and family. Uh, Things like uh, appeals to, once again, appeals to certain virtues at the expense of others. Convince me that, well, I'm doing some good even, in, even while all of this terrible things, all these terrible things are doing. At least while I'm doing all these terrible things, I should say. Hmm. It can work. It can work on most of us. And that is even being fully aware of all of these effects probably still be tricked, given enough effort. But being aware of what those circumstances might be can help you, one, avoid them, obviously, but then also pre-prepare for the kind of circumstances that you might encounter. For example, these last few years have been odd, don't you think? Like the world very fundamentally changed three-ish years ago? That, that whole thing. And so did a lot of our behavior and our choices and our, let's even say, our obedience to particular manners of authority under certain circumstances. I, I don't know about you, but there are things I was convinced into doing over these last few years that I never would have. I never would have thought I could ever be possibly convinced to do before, you know, everyone was and it was the thing to be done and, uh, and well, it's for, for a proper purpose and 
guide it and cajole it along, it along the path towards doing it. And that is, by the way, uh, I, in case it's not clear, I'm referring specifically to all of the we know now entirely impotent and ineffective pandemic response measures that were put into place over the last few years. So, for example, classroom context. I knew all along, I knew this from the start, that, say, having a class that was half online and half in the classroom, right? having some people in the classroom and some people on Zoom on the, on the TV screen, I knew that wasn't going to work. I knew it was going to be ineffective. I knew it was going to be significantly negatively impacting the learning of everyone involved. But I did it. I had the option of taking the entire class online, which would have been better for everyone, by the way. Again, studies show this. This is all borne out by research. I knew it at the time. Everyone knew it at the time. We tried something new. It didn't work. We knew it didn't work immediately. But we kept doing it. We, meaning me as well. I, I participated in this. I went along with it. And I did it by convincing myself, well, I, I need to at least provide the students who want to come out, actually to come into a classroom, the opportunity to do so. And maybe I was doing something useful. Maybe I was doing something good. Maybe I was helping people. Because again, some of, these, some of the students actively told me that my class in particular was their only reason to get out of bed all week. That's a hell of a thing. That's a good thing. However, I was still, again, voluntarily, even if not enthusiastically, participating in the reasons for them staying in bed the rest of the week. So I was doing something helpful in the context of doing something extremely harmful. All of these things that we participated in, to some degree or another, a lot of which we, we acknowledge now were non-productive or even counterproductive over the last few years. And we knew even at the time should never have been done. Like we've known there has been extensive, extensive peer-reviewed, double-blind, rigorous scientific studies on the inefficaciousness of mask wearing in the context of upper respiratory infections going back over 100 years. But we all did it for two years plus, including in a classroom setting, where it has particularly extreme detriments, especially in a discussion-based classroom. Or even more so, in a discussion-based classroom where the discussion has to go on between people in the classroom and people online, making things even worse. But I went along with it, because I was trying to do better. I was trying to help matters, a little bit while still ultimately you know, effectively taking away two years' worth of education from a large number of students. Which ones? Uh, most of them were conducted in the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, which went into, during the pandemic and then following shortly afterward, there were a lot of studies that were conducted in the, the, uh, the effect of particularly widespread application of, uh, of um, cloth and or paper mask wearing uh, for transmission rates. And it was found that they basically had little to no effect, or at least no measurable effect on population scale. Um, now, there were some circumstances, like medical contacts, which since have been questioned here and there, um, but on a population level, again, it, and again, also, research that, was, that has been conducted now over the last only few months, because we didn't do that for a while, basically borne this out. And we were kind of in agreement that it didn't do much at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Might help with allergies, however, apparently. You should think about it again. Yeah. Um, but in any case, again, things like this, things like um, there were all sorts of things that a lot of people were convinced to do. I, I used an example of, uh, a couple of weeks ago of calling the police on your neighbors for having a Christmas party. Uh, there was a case that just came to light 
uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, this was in California, because of course it was in California, um, where there was a, a, um, a, a group, an enforcement group um, brought together by, uh, by the, I think it was the city, um, somewhere in the Bay Area, um, that was uh, spying on people, on, on, uh, particularly on churchgoers, in fact. This, was, this is part of the lawsuit that's ongoing, is that there, there seemed to be uh, targeted harassment of people going to church rather than to other places, uh, that did things like um, trespass, like explicitly trespass, um, go on to, once they were, they were expelled due to trespass, they went on to other compliant neighbors' properties and were literally watching over the fence, like with binoculars and an observation type thing, uh, to watch people enter and leave. Um, they purchased and de-anonymized anonymous location data from people's cell phones. It's a thing you can do, by the way. It's actually quite simple. Like you can, you can purchase, like you, you can purchase location data from, like Google. Um, and then de-anonymizing it is actually quite a simple matter of just following the particular dot, which has a data set ID, but it doesn't actually tell you who it is. Just follow it home, because we all go home quite regularly, and addresses are publicly available. So that's neat. Um, yeah. So this was actually a thing that was done uh, quite extensively, which. Could you be convinced to report on, arrest, um, fine, etc. people for going to church, going to the mall, going to work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was this this was in when did this happen? June ish. May, June, 2020. Violation of violation of, uh, of stay home orders, basically, in California, especially. Especially in California. Um, well, on a maybe sillier note. Well, if they go to work and stuff, how is the board thing being provided for them to stay home so they can make it live? No, of course not. Were they provided to you or to me or to? No, absolutely not. Would would you or did you do? This? <laughs> Come on now. I wasn't even banned at the time, so I don't know. Well, I wasn't either, but like, but again, knowing the uh, knowing the circumstances, could you be convinced to do something maybe not morally heinous, but utterly ridiculous, like that? I mean, probably. Really. <laughs> Fair point. No one is, I don't think anyone ever told me nothing, but I might be, I don't think, I don't really see a little bit business. This was actually a weirdly common thing, um, especially in high schools. Uh, in high schools especially, this was quite common. Uh, there were even some like university marching bands that were doing it though, which, funny, don't do that. Like, don't, okay, there are two circumstances in which it's actually really dangerous to wear a face covering, especially multi-layered. Um, one, in cases where you definitely need to intake and exhale large amounts of air, like playing an instrument or vigorous exercise. That. Um, and then the other circumstance being rain, because you're waterboarding yourself. Don't do that. Anyway, um, but, but you know, a lot of people were convinced that this was a good idea, convinced to do so. Not just convinced to do so, but convinced to coerce, cajole, convince harass other people into doing so. So again, I think that we today, you, I, all of us, we are quite susceptible to these kinds of effects. These kinds of effects of authority, of going along with something that we otherwise wouldn't do, that we otherwise acknowledge would not be a good idea, something that we would know is either Maybe, maybe on the sort of lower end, silly and ridiculous. Or on the higher end, extremely wrong. And we can, we can, I think, pretty easily be convinced not to just to go along with it, but to help make sure that it's done. Not just by me, but by somebody else. 
that's some of our behavior that I think we really need to closely analyze and be very careful about because I doubt this will be the last time that anyone tries to convince any of us to do something wrong. Even by very careful, manipulative, psychological, and, and authoritative means. Because, well, that sure happens a lot. No, I mean, well. Another silly example. I mean, well, not silly example, but silly causal initiator of a quite terrible example. Um, it's actually quite easy to get a large group of people to, say, break the law. One person needs to do it first. Uh, the, the Capitol insurrection on January 6th, we have pretty solid evidence now that a lot of the people who went in first were either federal agents themselves or employed by federal agencies. So, okay, great, you get somebody to, you know, trample over a police barricade. Yeah, everybody behind them is probably just gonna keep walking on in. Now that can be, you know, an agent provocateur, which, you know, technical sense, like somebody who is making the crowd look bad in particular, but it also could just be somebody who has a really bad idea and then everybody else decides that, well, maybe it's not that bad of an idea after all. And, you know, it's funny until you get dozens of people in solitary confinement for a year. That's less fun. It's really easy to do these sorts of things. It's really easy to get yourself convinced into doing these sorts of things. And unfortunately, it's quite easy to convince people to do awful things. Quote, it raises the possibility that human nature cannot be counted on to insulate man from brutality and inhumane treatment at the direction of malevolent authority. We can do things to mitigate it. We can do things to steel ourselves against it. We can do things to build our character such that we're less likely to do it. We can do things to be aware of the effects of it and be aware of the particular mechanisms and so to avoid them and to counteract them to some degree but that takes a lot of careful effort, careful consideration over a lifetime, basically. 